Okay. I'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual uh, individuals, uh, which is the topic for today. And uh, let me just get my slides. Uh, um, here we go. Um, so I think one of the things that's important is to embed this talk in the context that all of us, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity, um, still have a life cycle. And I, I love uh, Erickson's life cycle, this idea that all of us uh, struggle with uh, trust versus mistrust, autonomy and shame, initiative and guilt, uh, it, the issue of being productive or industrious versus being inferior, uh, this idea of identity versus confusion, which I think particularly is an issue for many LGBTQIA people, and this issue of intimacy versus isolation, which I think also touches us uh, uh, who uh, have uh, an alternative sexual orientation, shall we say, um, as well as issues of generativity and stagnation and integrity versus despair. So those are developmental tasks for all of us. I think that um, when we start talking about uh, sexual orientation, I also think that uh, some key concepts include the idea of that uh, sexual orientation is fluid, that across time, men and women have found intimate primary relationships with the same as well as uh, the other gender, that uh, uh, sexual fluidity doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's bisexual, but it, it is certainly clear that given certain circumstances, many people, um, the majority of people, could respond uh, sexually to both genders. Um, uh, it, that does not mean there isn't such a thing as an orientation, but that I think our social milieu and, uh, and other contexts uh, need to be understood in the context of sexual orientation. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that orientation is fluid or, or, excuse me, a matter of choice, um, and, nor does it mean that it's all about nurture. Um, or even is everyone fluid. But I think that that's a key concept of this idea of sexual fluidity that I think is important for the talk today. I'll also mention that um, there's a fair amount of, uh, and one of your readings talks about sexual fluidity in women. And that's sort of well established at this point. And there's an understanding that about twice as, uh, the, the percentage of women who engage in, shall we say, same sex sexual uh, activity is about twice that of men. But as we learn more data and get more data, I think there's also the idea that that uh, men and fluidity is also being revisited. And that um, uh, it, it may, in fact, the differences between men and women may be more of an artifact of what's acceptable for um, uh, men and women. And I think this may particularly be changing for millennial men who are more likely to identify as mostly straight compared to prior generations, uh, which tend to, uh, male generations, which tended to be more uh, polarized, uh, either exclusively heterosexual or exclusively homosexual. Um, so um, I think that uh, as we start talking about the LGBTQIA population, I wanna remind you that um, although we're, our time doesn't allow us to focus a good deal on, on asexual communities, that's an important um, community, an important movement, and there are a number of uh, materials that you're, I would invite you to look at. I've, I've given you some links, particularly uh, on asexuality, but there's also issues of, of celibacy. So many people uh, who are not asexual, they're sexual beings, but they may choose to be celibate. And, um, and then more generally, some discussions about sexual fluidity. Um, um, so I've given you those links. I think that what we do know is that uh, there's a, that we, we do know that an idea of, of sexual identity is fixed is really an outmoded concept. And, um, and that many, of, if not most scholars reject this notion of this sort of linear developmental approach. Um, and in some ways, and some of the, some uh, authors have suggested that's particularly an artifact of models that were developed based primarily on Western white men, and, uh, and that, in fact, women and um, some folks would suggest non-white populations have long described less linear and perhaps a more fluid identity. 
uh, it's particularly true, say, for instance, in indigenous populations in the United States, uh, Native American communities. And so I think the whole idea of models, particularly when we talk later today about coming out, have to be understood in this, uh, this uh, context, if you will. I think, again, I just uh, reiterating what I said, just said, is that identity development must be understood in the context of clearly biology, personality characteristics, family history, race, gender, uh, ethnicity, social class, and other contexts. And, um, uh, uh, and that, in general, uh, the identity of women has been more fluid than men. Um, one, one way to think about sexual orientation, if you plotted this out on a, a, a grant, uh, 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 if you plotted this out, is there's the Kinsey stick, which I asked you to comment on this week, which is the sort of idea that people are from exclusively heterosexual to exclusively homosexual. Another multidimensional way to look at that is depending upon whether you're high or low on uh, homoeroticism or what we might call heterosexual heteroeroticism. And so you could be low on both, in which case you may be asexual. You can be high on um, uh, hetero heteroeroticism and uh, at the far end be heterosexual. You could be responsive to both uh, homosexual as well as heterosexual. Uh, kind of stimuli, in which case you're bisexual, and of course, uh, uh, gay or bisexual, uh, someone who, who would be high on homoeroticism. I think that's a more useful way to think about sexuality. Another uh, key concept, I think, when we talk about LGBTQI uh, populations, and this is really a borrowed, if you will, from uh, research primarily on race and ethnicity and minority stress, that, that um, uh, that, that being a minority across any number of dimensions in terms of being a minority con uh, confers a certain amount of stress often. And, that, um, and that's important to address with LGBTQIA po populations. Um, it's also important to take a positive psychology approach. And, in, and uh, Budge in her really a, a very brief, but I think kind of seminal uh, little article, if I could uh, editorialize. It's not even particularly well written, but just so smart and good um, about thinking about that we, we need to remember to use hope uh, in the context of working with our LGBTQIA population and, and address family contextual uh, systems. And I think we, we, um, we forget that I think most families, my experience of 40 years of seeing LGBTQI people, most people's families do come around. Um, that, that often I think the lesbian and gay person in sharing an identity um, has, um, you know, had years to come to terms with that. And often families are shocked and it takes them a while. And, um, uh, and that uh, a lot of people fear rejection from family. And my experience is most often they don't experience it. Uh, that the family, um, maybe through a cognitive dissonance process, even families that may be somewhat homophobic, um, because they love their child and their child, they may not like gay people, but they love their child, they begin somehow to uh, make peace with that. And uh, I think we, um, we need to remember that in the context of the clients that we see. Um, and I think another piece of this is that although being lesbian or gay uh, or queer or uh, uh, trans, is not associated with psychopathology, stressors in the lives of people who are gay and lesbian uh, can result in higher rates of certain symptoms. And this is something I would also observe. Uh, you know, it's hard to be a minority. And I think the, you, you wanna think about, of course, the intersectionality of minority stress in the context of things like race and ethnicity. So what's the challenges uh, for ethnic racial minority groups who are also LGBTQI. And it's substantial, very substantial. And there's even data to suggest the multiple um, stressors that some people experience uh, as a function, say, of racism and homophobia. Some of the implications of minority stress in the community um, are that, uh, in general, bisexual people report higher perceived stresses than other groups of, of um, LGBTQIA people, 
that transgender people tend to report more depressive symptoms and discrimination, overt discrimination, not surprising. That in general in the US, uh, blacks and Latinos report higher perceived stress and discrimination than whites. Like tell us something we don't know, that's obvious. Um, male participants of, uh, versus women in general report more overt homophobia. Um, uh, we can hypothesize why that might be true. I think that the, uh, uh, perhaps I won't hypothesize at the moment, but uh, maybe we'll come back to it. Findings indicate a significant impact on minority stressors and social psychological resources on mental health and substance abuse, particularly for mi sexual minority women. And healthcare professionals should assess for minority stress working with L LGBTQIA people, coping resources, and um, and refer as needed for evidence-based uh, treatments, for instance, for anxiety disorders or mood disorders. I think uh, one uh, uh, subgroup of, of people, uh, particularly gay men of color, particularly black and Latino gay men of color, um, um, have high rates of minority stress and very high rates of HIV disease. In fact, it's estimated that um, uh, a 19-year-old uh, black a man living in uh, uh, the Northeast has about a 50% chance of becoming HIV infected across their lifetime. That's a really catastrophic risk of infection, and it's a it really speaks to this issue of homophobia, racism, um, and health disparities. And uh, I think that the, the best thinking about this in a couple of articles, one of which came out recently, is that stigma about homosexuality for these men of color and an increased base rate of traumatic life experiences uh, may explain this risk. One, it's interesting, the use of what's called PrEP, which is a pro, a pre, um, excuse me, it's a prophylactic uh, HIV cocktail that people take from, to, get, uh, to keep from getting infected. Um, that it's been shown to be really widely um, uh, effective, but we've uh, not been successful worldwide or in this country with getting uh, men of color to, uh, or women in general to uh, take PrEP. And uh, uh, so I think that, uh, uh, and that's again, speaks to this issue of health disparities and perhaps mistrust of the medical community, of which there's ample um, evidence of uh, particularly in the United States with um, uh, sort of research uh, without consent that's been done uh, with African-American populations. So um, we've got a lot of work to do in this area. Um, I think when we talk about, because um, this is one of the areas I'm interested in because I did HIV and have done some scholarship, is that uh, we do know that uh, men who are traumatized, who have histories of trauma in childhood and are gay identified, for instance, have more acts of unprotected receptive anal intercourse, increased numbers of sexual partners, they have more uh, of a, a history of trading sex for money or drugs, uh, report having HIV, uh, that they've uh, been the victim of non-sexualized violence, and that they are more likely to engage in sex mediated by alcohol and drug use. Again, I would understand all this in the context of tremendous stressors that some LGBTQIA people, particularly people of color, experience in this country. Another key concept of this, and just come back to the issue of abuse and identity development, is that I, I come back to uh, Judy Herman's uh, work uh, from 1992 that trauma in, a, uh, in adults may um, erode structures of personality, that in children it may um, uh, really challenge personality, that uh, this sense of disempowerment and disconnection can have uh, negative health consequences, that issues of distrust, shame, guilt, inferiority, confusion, isolation, and despair may result, and that trauma uh, most frequently is associated with problematic relationships, impulsivity, disturbances of self and self-destructiveness. Again, most gay people do not um, engage in, I can say, traumagenic behaviors. But given um, the issues of minority stress and, um, and uh, ways in which we, if you will, are victimized, uh, we, we're not, I'm not surprised uh, that we see more trauma and the uh, post-traumatic sequelae of that. 
Let me also talk about what we do know about from the, the data that gay men and lesbians have higher rates of traumatic life experiences, which predisposes them, meaning us, to anxiety, including PTSD, mood and personality disorders, that sexual abuse and other forms of interpersonal violence may, may predispose some to negative mental and physical outcomes. Um, one such study looked at 445 young Latino men and about a third uh, be, uh, reported being assaulted because of their perceived um, sexual orientation. It's interesting. Gay men are not more likely necessarily to um, report being sexually abused, but they are more likely to report that when they, in fact, I, I misspoke. We're, we do not generally report more physical or interpersonal violence. In fact, we report less than our heterosexual male counterparts. But when we are uh, the recipient of violence, it's often in the context of a homophobic or hate crime act. So, uh, research on lesbians um, and including gay men, particularly during adolescence and young adulthood, suggests a greater than average risk of suicide and chemical abuse. That actually, it's um, uh, when you get into the weeds with it, lesbians are more likely to abuse alcohol than their uh, female heterosexual counterparts, and uh, uh, but gay men are more likely to abuse drugs, chemical, other chemical agents compared to uh, their heterosexual male counterparts. Um, and in in fact, uh, of a, a study of just under 3,000, which is a nice sample. 20% of the urban gay men reported histories of childhood sexual abuse. And I, I'll, I'll talk about why I think that is the case. Um, and uh, in one uh, a study that was a chart review, they looked at um, uh, uh, lesbian and gay men on a inpatient units who were chemically addicted and that 50% of them had uh, childhood sexual abuse. Although that I would guess that's about the same for their heterosexual counterparts on a chemical uh, abuse unit. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons why uh, gay men in particular may be targeted for sexual abuse is that uh, perpetrators generally, mo perpetrators most of whom are men, generally target the most vulnerable children, that gender atypical boys are really some of the most vulnerable children, and, uh, and that in a sense violence is often used against these boys for uh, acting out or teaching other boys to use to uh, for, for not in, uh, sort of conforming to gender stereotypes, if you will. I want to move a little bit from some of the um, primarily talking about uh, lesbians and gay men uh, to talking about transgender populations and transgender health, which is a huge issue, and I don't have uh, really time in this, um, in this piece to do justice to it, but I'm going to at least start that I think that one of the things that we want to know is that, um, first of all, understand that, that only some gender non-conforming people, particularly younger people these days, experience what we might call gender dysphoria at some point in their lives, but that um, this discomfort and distress caused, caused by the discordance between gender identity and assigned sex uh, is called gender dysphoria, and lots of uh, people do struggle with that, and that's often uh, when we're working with clients, um, often uh, for people who have not transitioned, um, it is around what we might call gender dysphoric uh, behavior. There is a World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and, uh, uh, and they, first of all, emphasize when, when we talk about working with transgender populations that we want to assess for gender dysphoria. We want to provide psychosocial information about options for gender identity, the expression, even possible medical interventions. We want to make sure we assess, diagnose, and treat coexisting mental health concerns. Remember, this is a population that talked about more higher rates of depression um, and uh, suicidal ideation. Um, and then um, in many instances, but by no means all, we might want to work with people to help to prepare them to, uh, and refer them for hormone uh, therapy. And, uh, and when applicable, and, and a large number of people don't have um, gender assignment surgery, but um, um, we, we can uh, help to assess people's eligibility, prepare them, and refer for surgery. Uh, it used to be that with transgender uh, populations that they, in order 
to um, particularly for homeowner surgery, surgical interventions, that they had to have a minimum number of psychotherapy sessions, but they've done away with that, which I think makes sense. And then the final thing, and I mentioned this in class, I think when we're working with very young people who may be uh, thinking about trans uh, 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 transitioning or, um, or questioning their gender, um, we, we, we think about not just for hormone therapy, which the slide says, but are, are they persistent about um, their belief that um, uh, their assigned gender is not their gender? Are they insistent about it over time, and are they consistent? Again, that's really key with young people, persistent, insistent, and consistent. There are surgical options. There's uh, the male to female options and female to male options, and you can read about those. Um, there, it's not a walk in the park. Uh, these are difficult surgeries, uh, difficult operations. They do have side effects, and uh, many younger people in particular are not necessarily um, choosing the surgical option um, as a percentage. What I mean, this is complex. There are more surgeries going on than ever. But if you look at the percentage of people who identify as transgender, a lower percentage is opting for the surgical route, even though more people are identifying as transgender. Okay. I want to, uh, didn't get to this in, in some of the class, so I want to also mention the I in LGBTQIA, that indeed there are a number of intersex, what we might call variations. And, uh, uh, some of these are mediated most by uh, hormonal disorders um, and um, or what we might call unclassified forms of abnormal development or different development. And some of the intersex uh, syndromes, and there are some links I can give you at a later time, are include uh, Turner syndrome, uh, Kleinfelter syndrome, androgen intensity syndrome, adrenal hypoplasia, and 5-alpha uh, reductase. Uh, uh, syndrome, and uh, uh, that people who were neither male nor female um, or were um, had characteristics of both genders have always been with us, and we don't want to forget that. Finally, what I want to talk about is, and this is one model, this is a model that I've worked on um, and have published about. It was in some ways the basis of my dissertation a million years ago. And uh, I do think, uh, although it's a linear model, um, I still think it's helpful for those of us who are, you know, who are clinicians, which is how do we sort of understand the struggle that people often go through that are coming out, particularly as lesbian or gay. And, um, and then I think it's really a, a two-pronged um, uh, process. One is the first and earliest stages, people are really asking the question, who am I? They're confused about who they are. They're kind of comparing themselves to their counterparts, and they may not have the same feelings about uh, if your assigned gender is male. You may not have the same feelings as other uh, uh, cisgender men toward um, uh, uh, women, and that causes a kind of comparison. And Often people go from being confused to comparing to just tolerating the identity. They don't like it, but they begin to acknowledge that they do have these, these feelings or desires uh, that may be dissonant for them. So that's really the who am I stage, and that's where people are in most distress, and my own research suggested they were the people that were, uh, had the least psychological well-being. Um, then I think the issues, uh, once people answer the question, who am I, um, then they are starting to think about, well, where do I belong? And, um, and so hopefully they move into a phase of accepting their identity and some people's social uh, context, power, uh, other intersectionalities may make that more or less difficult. So they may, on a, on a personal level, accept who they are but they may be very uh, discreet or um, not share that with a lot of other people, particularly if there's issues of safety. Uh, for people that are privileged, um, like yourself largely, uh, university students and such, often there's a radicalization and a kind of pride stage, um, but you can kind of be out and proud um, much more easily if you are safe. <laughs> and um, 
And then I think as people mature, they get older, you begin to synthesize your sexual identity when it's no longer novel or you've settled into midlife. It's, it's, a, it's one part of who you are, but um, it's, um, it's not the whole thing. And uh, you, you um, as I've said uh, before, I mean, as a 64-year-old um, married uh, gay male, I have a lot more in common, frankly, with other 64-year-old married people across sexual orientation than I do with 23-year-old single people. I just do. And, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and that's, that represents maybe uh, where we synthesize our identity as one part of who we are. I think some of the clinical implications, I'll just present a few cases of, of someone who's struggling with who am I, uh, was a person that I worked with, an African-American female um, married to, uh, oh no, a uh, female married to a 28-year-old uh, Latino male, they've been married, she went to a gay bar, found herself attracted to a young woman, she began to entertain this idea I might be a lesbian, uh, but also uh, really starts to mourn about what would it be like to uh, uh, leave a husband that she loves, disappoint conservative uh, Christian parents, and, and in her mind maybe not become a mother. Uh, and so, uh, so that the work would be around um, helping her to, to clarify her sexual orientation um, clarify what it would mean to be a lesbian, um, explore her, uh, her, you know, in her solitude, what does she think about when she thinks about romance or sexual desire? Is that for men, women, or both men and women? And then um, once she's reconciled them, then you can begin to ask, answer the question of where does she belong? Or even does she want to leave her husband? Does she want to come out? Which could also be a choice. Um, a where do I belong kind of case, maybe I, I worked with a young gay male professional who emigrated and was a refugee, and he had a history, really very serious and sad, long history of physical and sexual abuse, although he was a really resilient guy, which was impress impressive. Um, he, he, was, um, he was very gender atypical as a child and was sexually assaulted in some camps that he was at uh, as a refugee. And, um, and that he had a very problematic relationship with men that were, um, uh, that intimacy led him to get very anxious and um, uh, make bad choices about people and, uh, and have very anxious attachments that tended to drive people away. And um, I think that the, so the issue was not, he knew he was gay, he was gay identified, he was comfortable with that, but then it, where do I belong and how do I do this thing about having a relationship with other people? And that was really the challenge uh, for him. So um, that really concludes this teaser, if you will, of my talk. And, um, uh, and uh, we um, hopefully it will lead to some more fulsome discussion in, uh, in other classes. So, thank you.